Okay. Um, the series has an underlying core, and that core is the idea that the world is getting more and more uh, computable. And this actually started in uh, 1938 when Church and Turing, Alan uh, Turing and Alonzo Church separately came up with the idea of um, a symbol machine, uh, a Turing machine. And the idea is that a symbol description that could run itself. And that was kind of the big bang of a Turing reality, if you will. The reason that's important is that you're seeing it happen now. Self-driving car, what happened with a self-driving car? We increased the level of digitization of the job to be done when they put the LIDAR on top and spun it around. And they if you multiply that times the level of knowledge, that is the physics of how a car drives, which was pretty well known, that that made the driving environment computable, which meant you had a self-driving car. Uh, similar things are happening. We're going to have some illustrations in terms of 3D uh, surgical planning. Surgical planning didn't used to be computable. Now it's computable. So this is a through line. Uh, and then in terms of the levels of knowledge, you can think of it as categorization, correlation, causation as increasing levels of knowledge. G, it's green. G, the green goes with the red. G, the green causes the red um, as different levels of knowledge. And when you have a high level of knowledge times high digitization equals computable, you radically can change the economics of any business. And if you're computing something and somebody else isn't or somebody else is computing something and you're not, you're really in trouble. Um, so that that through line and 5G is a big shot in the arm for that. So uh, first, just before we uh, head into this, and I'm going to um, have Toby start to tell us about 5G. I just want to give you a little bit of background about Toby. Um, he is one of the most uh, uh, interesting characters I know for a number of reasons. He has a phenomenal personality. But in addition, his breadth of understanding from the arts to science and from organizations to um, Oh, thanks. You want to go back to Toby? Yeah. From organizations to um, to projects. Uh, there's just I've never met a person with a broader uh, purview of practical, theoretical uh, and uh, political and economic. And so that's why he's been able to get some of the things done that he's been able to get done. He um, has worked for a number of large companies, you know, FedEx. Uh, I met him when he was at Motorola. Uh, American Express, who's CIO there, Aviva, which is a massive UK insurance company. Uh, and now uh, he is at Verizon and he's also done work on his own. He's done some ventures and so forth. He, and he's also in the middle of a, a conversation uh, with a group down at Lake Nona, which is 150 square miles of a brand new city that's only 10 to 15 minutes away from Orlando Airport. And they're building a community from the ground up. Uh, kind of doing what Walt Disney wanted to do with celebration, but better. Um, and so, uh, and, and in addition, he's got some fantastic stories. And um, he grew up in Mexico City. Uh, he had two sets of parents. It, it's just, it, it never ends uh, in terms of the insight and fun. Uh, so with that, I give you Toby Redshaw. And Toby, good morning, good afternoon. Hey, good afternoon. Glad, glad to be here. Um uh, let, let me let me just start at a really uh, uh, a really high level, and then uh, we can drill into the uh, the metavis stuff in a, in, a, in a minute as a as an example. So I'm I'm super excited about now, right? I've been in technology and innovation and change, uh, um, you know, for for decades, and it is the most intensive time from a business change wave meets technology change waves uh, ever. Everybody in B2B uh, is trying to become B2B to C. You know, that's been been a train coming for 20 years. Uh, people who are in uh, make big honking things want to sell those as managed services. That's been coming our way. That's starting to, to really uh, uh, um, grow and get mass. Um, sales is turning into experience. It has longitudinal experience uh, attached to that. Digital snackable commerce is starting to enter into all of those things. The the underlying structure of the dark web is going to make the next three or four years of hacking uh, the worst we've ever seen. It'll make the last 10 years look like kindergarten. Um, and then you've got the fourth industrial revolution and um, uh, the technology change waves and 5G coming from the other side. So it is the biggest 
time for creative destruction uh, um, in, in my lifetime, right? And the, the folks out in Davos at the World Economic Forum refer to, refer to this as the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is a very, very simple thing. Their, their viewpoint is no matter what you think about cloud and AR, VR and IoT and AI and big data and how much those have progressed in the last 10 years, which is, which is a lot, their view is, look, um, over the next five years, there's a quantum shift in those four technologies um, that's going to drive a, uh, um, a thing we call the fourth industrial revolution, which remember the last three changed the world. So that's a really, really big statement. The big difference with the fourth industrial revolution is it's not going to take, you know, four or five decades. It's going to take six years. So that's coming uh, uh, coming now, layer on top of that, it's the easiest time in the world in, in world history to get a bunch of capital to form and start a company, but also to scale it, um, including the hard bits of scaling, scaling your manufacturing, scaling your supply chain. You can almost rent all of those pieces. Go to a company like Prologis for the supply chain, Alibaba for manufacturing, or twelve others. Um, uh, so the so as those four um, technologies, hockey stick, whether that's in terms of impact or value per unit dollar or pervasiveness, um, this, this trend, right? This is the, this is the 10 years looking back from today. And we all get that these have grown. So it seems kind of strange to say these are going to hockey stick after that much growth, but trust me, I'm close to, I'm close to all of those technologies. The next the next five years looks like this, this, this hockey stick. Now imagine all of these things could live on a new network that's super fast, can manage gigantic, huge files and bandwidth, has a really, really low latency, which is how quickly do you get back to the network, do your processing and get back to the uh, endpoint, is a thousand X better for IoT density 10x better for IoT battery life, which changes the economics uh, of IoT. And it's not just a network, but has compute built in at the edge. So now you have a supercomputer in your back pocket. Man, that'd create this crazy flywheel effect and new, uh, new platforms and new approaches. The thing I just said is literally the logic behind the fourth industrial revolution. The other thing I just said is I just described what a 5G network is. So it's the combination of those four technologies on a flywheel uh, of the new uh, network that that's basically going to change the world like the last three industrial uh, revolutions. So let me demystify 5G really quickly, and then we can get into the uh, get into the pragmatic um, meat of this. So 5G is really two things, right? It's a network, uh, but why is it different than than 4G? Well, in these dimensions of what things do in the network, right? How uh, you can communicate with things that are moving really, really fast. Uh, how energy efficient is it? How many connected devices can it connect to? How quickly do you do service deployment? Reliable and then latency, which is techno gobbledygook for how quickly you get a response, right? I can uh, take a dumb camera, look at something in, a, in an environment, bring back the pixels to the edge, do the processing to get intelligence from that. Well, that person's never been here before, that's a security problem, or that's a new customer, or that's a defect on the factory floor. I can do that whole cycle in 30 milliseconds, right? That is one-tenth of a blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. but that's a really big difference, but this is really only half the story for, uh, uh, for 5G. The other half is because it's a software-defined cloud-native network, which is techno gobbledygook, uh, it really means the edge of the network becomes compute. So it does all of these crazy, cool, big, fast, rapid response things. It comes with built-in uh, compute at the edge of the network. So now you can do things in real time, uh, intelligently in ways you could never do that, um, uh, do that before. And here's the big breakthrough thought, right? The real world functions in real time, right? Getting a whisper in your ear inside a FedEx hub, hey, stop, uh, there's a tug coming, you're gonna get run over. Getting that 30 seconds after you've been run over, not, not super useful, 
right? The whole real time intelligence, the pervasive pervasiveness is going to change um, uh, a lot of things. Um, if we, I, I'm not sure what the next slide is, but I think uh, um, yeah, to this. yeah, if we jump to this, I'll I'll give you uh, I'll give you one uh, example. Are we going to run this video? Yes. There we go. So this is the ability to take information that we've already got, right? CT, MRI scans, and to be able to project those in real time on top of the uh, uh, the patient, to be able to drill down rather than just have them printed out in slices and black and white on the wall, it's to add this intelligence. Now, what do you need to do this? You need compute at the edge, you need crazy good uh, bandwidth, and you need immediate response. Um, these bright folks, two uh, medical professionals working out of a closet in our 5G lab uh, in New York, built this amazing, uh, this amazing thing, and it just ups the quality while reducing the cycle time of surgery. Right? Which mm -hmm. the hospital I can get more surgeries done. I love that economically. Ups the 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 quality of it, um, uh, which is you know what you care about, uh, uh, what you care about more, eliminating. Uh, rework in the process, becoming more precise um, uh, as you do this. Again, that's bandwidth and compute at the edge, and that uh, that that latency. Yeah. So, Tubby, our, uh, our mutual friend, Dr. Larry Smart. Um, you know, uh, you know, in terms of the surgical planning, I think, I mean, a massive amount of time is spent doing surgical planning. Um, but the other thing is there's so much, I think, at least I didn't appreciate how much variety there is in the human body so that, you know, not everybody's, you know, duodenum is in the same place or, you know, their liver and how it lies and what's, you know, what its shape is. And so much of surgery is going in and finding out where things are. Um, and I remember you were saying about brain surgery, it's the same thing. I know in plastic surgery, which uh, I know some about, um, I'm talking about reconstructive plastics, not, not cosmetic. Uh, the surgical planning would take a ton of time. The way they would do it would be with plaster models and measurements of the heads of the of the children and then x-rays. And then the beautiful thing about this is not only could they do surgical planning because when they're in the middle of an operation, everything's swollen. So they don't know where they are in XYZ space anymore. And you know, if you're if the replacement of an eye is off by two millimeters, that's a big deal, you know. Um, and the other beautiful thing is when you have these kinds of models, you can do synthetic growth because the way that surgical interventions were planned in reconstructive plastics was you operate on a bunch of kids and you watch them grow. You know, does it work? Doesn't work. And here you can actually synthetically do it. And they discovered many things that have to do with facial growth and other things just by doing this kind of work. Yeah. Just, the icing on that cake, the, the icing on that cake is that because this is digital, because you can run patterns against it, because you can do analysis against it, and you can look across an entire sea uh, of, of cases, whether it's stroke therapy or brain surgery or the Whipple procedure, which is how you go in and get the duodenum if it's gone bad, which, oh, by the way, is a 15-hour operation. Um, you can get better just by an having machines analyze this. Uh, there's some wonderful stuff going on at, uh, at Johnson & Johnson uh, in, in this area where you can get the data and the metadata and you can say, hey, John, when you do this surgery, you take five and a half hours. Tobe, you take seven. Let's show you the differences and how you, uh, how you get better. Or let me immerse you into this environment as a student and let you uh, walk through this. Or let me just have the machine look at patterns of success, and what do we dis what what do we uh, uh, what do we discover? So I think that that's uh, the intelligence. So this is this is one platform, right? This is AR, uh, XR, VR stuff. The other two big things that compute at the edge and fantastic clever networks will allow you to do is to put your artificial intelligent models right at the edge and run those in real time. Um, and then the other, um, uh, the other big uh, uh, part of that um, is the ability to take dumb cameras, uh, capture pixels, $50 camera, and then do the basic compute at the edge to do intelligence, right? To find vibrations in equipment before they break, uh, heat maps, uh, where are your customers? What are they doing? Security elements, find defects in 
circuit boards, manage, here's a really important one, manage the crowd flows to the shortest beer line at a stadium. Um, anything that you can think of where you can give me photons, I can turn that into intelligence. So what do those three platforms really do? Why should we care, right? Pervasive AI at the edge, the super cool AR, VR stuff, uh, um, uh, and then the, you know, the, 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 uh, the other important stuff we were talking about on all of those, uh, um, uh, all of those examples with cognitive, uh, cognitive video. Sure. Um, so what that does is really two things. The folks that adopt this, mm -hmm. their operations become proactive and predictive and pattern matched and preventative and permissioned and peer connected and precise because I'm now using these things in my operations, that lowers my operational cost structure and it reduces the defects. Same thing that's happening with this surgery. I then use that same technology with the engagement with my customers. It improves the customer lifecycle value. It makes me more proactive and, per and permissioned, mm -hmm. and preventative and precise with my customers. So if you think about business, that's all business really is. As long as you get your strategy uh, right, right? No amount of good technology will save you from a uh, bad strategy. Uh, uh, there's nothing you can do about that. That is, is, is self-determining. Um, but if you, if you have a good strategy and you implement these platforms and you get the, the seven Ps, business A, better operational cost structure, fewer def defects, that adds into the customer value proposition. You use it on the customer side better customer value. I mean, I wasn't the smartest kid at business school, but that is your business, right? And I've already got companies, even risk committees on boards, pinging me going, we're really worried that if the enemy gets there before we do, we can't win that. Uh, uh, we can't win that battle. So that's the pragmatic side. And these three platforms that I talked about are the beginning. There will be other uh, um, uh, other platforms. Yep. One one comment on this, the, I get a lot of pushback on the AR side. You know, okay, so that's okay for surgery, but you'll never see AR, VR stuff adopted uh, broadly. I have uh, a one word for that, and it's uh, Pokemon Go, although it's a compound word. Not very useful, not very hard technology, definitely not useful for the enterprise. 50 million users in 19 days. Now imagine I had intelligent AR that was designed for you on your job to help you get something done. And oh, by the way, your boss told you you had to use it, but it was truly useful, personalized and intelligent. What's the adoption curve on that, right? I, I, I don't think, you know, three years from now, anybody will do surgery without that sort of stuff that you just, just saw. So incredible change moment, a lot of creative destruction. What people forget in creative destruction cycles is it includes the word destruction you don't want to be on that end of that deal. Yes. No, it's, it's uh, one of the comments from Mike uh, in the, in the comment field here is from Mike Boyle. Um, and he was saying that uh, uh, he, they're investing in a company that does a 3d print of the organ that's going to be operated on so that the, so that the folks, um, uh, the surgeons can practice on a physical version of your, whichever organ they're operating on before they get in there. You yeah, know, that's, that's, that's brilliant. brilliant. Plus, Mike, uh, I think Mike owes me money from the last golf game we had. I, I wouldn't be surprised. The uh, the <laughs> uh, we have, we have a question about okay, if you have computing at the edge, and we get at the security issues, right? Uh, you know, okay, if we have computing at the edge of the network, why is there a concern about hardware manufacturers being a potential national adversary? You know, so is it you know? Is it very important to have hardware produced at highly trusted companies? Um, so three things embedded in there. Uh, the, the, at a high level, um, you absolutely should be concerned about this. The, the underlying structures in the dark web, it's the most Darwinian, positively Darwinian place I know where they evolve faster than anybody else, mostly because they can just steal the tech. They don't have to buy it, right? So. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and they've gone to an asset light model. They're super AI intensive. Uh, they are focused not on splashy hacks, on harvesting money and keeping that secret. Not a fair fight. Uh, you want to be the hardened target, not the soft target that they go after. Seriously, the next five years of this stuff uh, is going to make the last 10 years look like kindergarten. Second part of that, uh, that comment is as compute moves to the edge, 
the target, uh, and as you know, more and more devices get out there and IoT grows exponentially, the target space for hacking just got way, way bigger, right? Think of how many bank robbers there were when there were 400 banks in America, and then how many there were when there were 40,000 banks, right? Maybe go back to the, the explosion of banks in the uh, when the regulation changed back in the 20s, or 19, 1910. Um, so the target space has grown. Um, really good for security to have your compute at the edge so it's not flying back and forth across the network. That helps. But what gets uh, what what gets lost in the security space is securing your your non IT you know your operational technology uh, uh, endpoints. Right? There's a very famous hack where somebody came in through the HVAC system and some clever person had put it on the whole network so they made it to the point of sale so they stole a bunch of credit cards. Right? So the hmm. the security job gets um, um, uh, gets harder. Um, and again. Security is an architectural problem, right? Um, if you don't get the architecture right, I don't care how thick your walls are, right? Uh, it, it's or how many layers you have. It's a, you've got to get the security architecture uh, uh, correct. Yeah, it's uh, as you say, the, the threat space gets so huge. Um, you know, what, one of the questions I um, had for you, Tobes, is uh, that um, is when you get out in the marketplace, you know, how do people think about this? Uh, you know, how prepared are they? And as we get into that, I'd like to go to our first polling question, which is how prepared do you think your organization is for 5G? I'm asking the, our audience here. So um, while folks are answering that, um, the uh, Toby, the what do you think the role of different uh, organizations, research labs, um, you know, partners, suppliers, and so forth are in doing innovation in this domain? So, um I, look, I, I think at a national level, um, I, I was very privileged to sit on the Council of Competitiveness and run the, the um, co-run the work stream for scale disruptive uh, technologies with just a bunch of certified smart people, especially from the national labs. It, the national labs are, are a national treasure. The, the work that goes on there, the level uh, of intelligence and smarts and innovation we need to find a way to do better public-private partnerships with that and with the university base, drive that into IP, drive that into uh, a positive change. I think it's a national, uh, I think it's a national treasure. And I think people are starting to work on that. Uh, uh, and I think, and also some of the, you know, the, the DOD uh, end of it, some really some of the smartest people I know are in, in D and DOD and the innovators at the VA, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for example. So I do think there's a big opportunity to, uh, do more there, especially if you care about, um, uh, you know, global competitiveness, which we kind of really should. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. In that domain, what's your sense of the, you know, the Western world, U.S. and your Western developed world, U.S., the EU and so forth, uh, you know, compared to um, the, uh, the, you know, uh, Asian countries, especially China? Uh, I, look, two, I, I think two things, and 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 this this might give me a bit of trouble, but but don't care. Um, uh, it's not a fair fight at the moment. Um, China takes a twenty-year horizon um, uh, on things. China uh, will put massive investment without political debate into things they think are important, like the the fusion program uh, that they put you know, tens of billions of dollars uh, uh, into their rollout of 5G is mm -hmm. enormous. Um, uh, and they do a really good job of leveraging an educational meritocracy and funneling those folks into there. Now, there are some very negative uh, uh, parts of China when you look from a, a human rights, uh, uh, social justice uh, and inequity parts, especially when you start to look at what's going on in, in Northwestern uh, China and, and Lord knows, don't want that system uh, um, uh, uh, over here. But but what it does mean is that we should look at that and react pragmatically. I don't think 
they have competitive advantages that we cannot overcome. When I look at the the innovation fabric that we have in America um, for just focusing on America, there's no way we should lose that uh, that competitive fight. We've got to fix the talent supply chain. We've got to fix uh, sort of up level some of the uh, the educational things. Um, leverage national labs better, but I but I I am I am very optimistic that you know impending uh, um, competitive failure will force us to go and do that, right? Yes. Well, yeah, it's interesting. The our poll came back, and it turns out that uh, the majority of folks, by far, said they were not prepared. Three said they were somewhat prepared, uh, and one said not at all. You know, so. Um, it's uh, only one felt that they were prepared for what's coming up with 5G out of our audience. So, you know, the order of five, 10% of our audience at least feels like, you know, they're on top of this. My, it, this is not true about lots of technology, um, but it's true about some of the big change, big pivotal stuff like 5G and the platforms that go, go with it. It's a practical thing. It's not a theoretical thing, right? So. It's like rugby or cooking in a commercial, uh, uh, cooking in a commercial kitchen. You can't just walk on the field one day and go, "All right, I've read up on this. I've got a couple of papers. I understand it conceptually. I'm going to go do it." Mm -hmm. If your competitors have been playing with this 5G stuff for a couple of years, they've been out on the pitch, getting the bumps and the bruises, uh, and getting the learning. That's a competitive advantage. Um, uh, over you because they have started to think differently and, and use these new platforms and new tools. So while it is still early days in 5G, mm -hmm. the best companies that I know of, the ones that are really lining up for the next war that aren't staffed for the last war are saying, okay, get my hands on these new tools and weapons. Let's learn. Let's get that, uh, that experience out on the pitch, on the field. So that we we are uh, um, uh, we are better. Yeah. So in terms of the um, some of the um, implications of this and so forth, and some of those learnings, um, you know, these are a set of uh, examples that you know you had given us uh, in terms of things. Do you want to speak to any of these in terms of? Uh, whether it is in production or some of those experimentations. Yeah, so so these are all uh, uh, real uh, discussions, real alpha, uh, you know, moving out of the lab into the real world um, uh, uh, efforts. Um, but th these are some more descriptions of what those little platforms do out in the real world, right? Because this is not, you know, I've got a photonic quantum computer in China that can solve math problems that are so arcane, nobody cares about it, has no application to uh, uh, to reality. These are, I'm going to go change my uh, my business. And when you de-techify all of this and have a conversation with somebody on the factory floor or at, you know, big uh, logistics companies or in the retail space, there's this click of, Oh well, that's that's what I care about. My operational cost structure, taking out defects, better engagement uh, with customers, uh, and fixing latent profit pools. If you look at if you look at healthcare or education or the food business or or, or construction from a supply chain old school supply chain throughput perspective, mm -hmm. there are gigantic profit pools there. If only you could have AI in real time at the edge and be supported by clever AR, XR uh, uh, things and manage IoT a little better and turn cameras into proactive, uh, precise, preventative uh, uh, tools. Man, that would really work. Well, that's exactly, uh, that's exactly what, we're, uh, uh, what we're talking about. And people want these because it's, it's a financial, uh, financial impact. The, the other interesting thing though that, that I would I would add here is companies seem to split into two really big camps for me on this. Uh, mm -hmm. And one is, you know, I'm, I'm successful. I've got this great army. We've been winning. This is great or, you know, not so great, but on some range of we're in it, right? Uh, we've got a great army lined up for the war. And then the other ones that are, yeah, look, 
the war is changing. The type of battle we're going to be having is going to be different very, very soon. I'm converting my army for the next war. Um, and I think it's the next war winners that are going to leave behind. There's lots of cycles of really clever companies that were lined up for the last war. Uh, and, and actually, military history is full of these, too, Sure. Um, that didn't make that transition. But it, it's a really psychologically leadership uh, uh, thing that that'll that is difficult. When I when I first came to Verizon, the chairman said, the CEO and chairman said, the things that made us successful in the past will doom us in the future. Not we have to pivot five degrees or, but all of those great things that we give people medals for and awards and sure. that that will doom us in the future, right? And I and I think that is such a smart and gutsy uh, thing to say out loud. Um, mm -hmm. Really, really hard to do. So, Toby, I know that in surgical planning, that's a very tangible thing that you guys are experimenting with, and I know there are a number of efforts. What are you? What are some of the other exciting ones that you can talk about? I know that you're doing some amazing stuff at the intersection of entertainment and education. I don't know how much of that you can speak to. Yeah. So, um, immersive. There's a there's an acronym I like because I invented it. Um, uh, immersive participative audience engagement. If I can put you in an immersive environment that lights up your whole brain and it's participative, your brain wants to be connected to other people, right? You don't want to be in a dark cave by yourself. So if I can be in this environment with a few other people, this digital uh, environment, and I can explore and I can go on a journey and it can follow me and be intelligent for me, and it knows how to uh, engage an audience, right? It, it knows what storytelling is. It knows how what my learning patterns are. It knows how to reinforce things. Knows how uh, how memory works. Um, that is a game changing platform. And some of the smartest people out of Hollywood are moving into um, uh, areas like this. Dreamscape is a, 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 a one example of that the early data on very rudimentary 360 video based environments which are nowhere near these uh you know gaming platform virtual uh, environments that you can't tell aren't real is that it's four times stickier from an educational perspective that whether you're being trained to be a safe warehouse worker at the defense logistics agency or you're learning you know, physics at MIT, uh, or, or you're a special operations fighter uh, um, doing repetition for uh, a dangerous mission, that the learning is four times stickier. And because this is a digital environment and I don't have to create uh, all of the other constructs or fly people in, it's mm -hmm. probably three to four times cheaper. Now, I'm not, I'm not the best salesman on earth, but if it's four times better and four times cheaper, I can sell that, right? Um, that's a 16x uh, impact. And then back to that thing I talked about earlier that I call evolutionary uh, intelligence, that I can take all the digital metadata off of this thing because it is digital, and I can continually improve and analyze um, mm -hmm. uh, analyze the, the, the metadata. Um, I, I'll give you one example. We did a thing with Columbia Medical, and we put stroke therapy into uh, a VR environment um, I put, uh, uh, and we gamified it and we analyzed it, but the cool, the cool thing is we can watch really good therapists work with patients, look at the analysis across all of it and say, Hey, you know what? Protocol two, stop using that in the first three weeks with patients. It does nothing. Start on week three. And for this cohort of patients where protocol seven and protocol eight are used together, there's a 45% uplift. I could take all the therapists in the world and put them in a room with whiteboards for a week and not see that, right? Because you're human and you don't see those patterns of that data. Living in a instrumented, digitized world lets you get on this continuous improvement path um, that's just otherwise not, not possible with some very basic uh, uh, machine learning to go help you do that. So I, again, do you want to be the seven Ps company that's on this path, or do you want to be the old one? Think about a think about a hospital. Do you want to go to the hospital that's proactive, predictive, pattern match, peer connected, precise, uh, uh, um, uh, and preventative, or do you want to go to the old one? 
yeah, I, you know, I want to go to the, the new one. Yeah, it, it, you remind me, Tob, of uh, the uh, the law of accelerating returns that Kurzweil talked about back in '98. You know, that the idea that technology drives knowledge and knowledge drives technology, and that, and 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 also a, a buddy of mine, Jim Cash, uh, said. Um, Hey, the only sustainable competitive advantage is a superior management system. The only sustainable competitive advantage is a superior management system. And I think what you're saying is, hey, look, there's a learning and management system here. I mean, yes, the technology is super important, but it's really the learning and management system that allows you to beat the competition. Yeah. You know, in the military environment, you know, you'd be in, inside the OODA loop, was it observe, or, orient, observe, observe, orient, uh, decide, act. Do I remember yeah. that? Uh, yeah. So so I think, you're, I think you're dead on, right? I think one of the few sustainable competitive advantages in the future, now, again, strategy is hard and good strategy matters, right. um, is agility, right? If, if I am, if my cycle time, my OODA loop uh, is better than yours, I win. You could be a chess grandmaster mm -hmm. and I could be, look, just average Toby. And if I get to move three times for every one time you move, I don't care how good at chess you are, I win. I don't care if you invent something better than what I've got and I can respond faster and you can't keep up. I win. And that, that intelligent fabric inside your company, love, love Jim. Uh, he taught me a key thing about change management. He said, um, sitting at a, a, a bar at an information week conference, he said, look, here's the key to change management to do change management. Sometimes you have to change management. Yeah, I remember that. And that is really difficult thing for companies uh, uh, companies to do when we change the culture at Motorola, sitting down with somebody who's been a top 5% performer for 10 years and saying, look, you can't work here anymore because we're not doing that old general patent command and control thing anymore. We're going to a matrix collaborative world and you suck at that. But I've been a top 10 performer for a decade. Yeah, but we're going to have to change management to do uh, to do change management and most companies won't step up to that uh that change process yeah absolutely are there any other uh specific things that um, you've been working on from a lab perspective that you know you think people should be aware of whether it's in manufacturing or retail or security or you know government um so i i think the utility of having um ai at the edge um and people get sort of confused about AI and big data, right? Oh, it's so hard. I need data scientists. Look, the, the AI you need to do for cancer genomics or to work on the data that comes off the fusion reactor at Lawrence Livermore or to win Jeopardy, that is really, really hard AI. You need some just crazy smart PhDs. Give me every bit of data at a FedEx hub or a hospital or giant stadium or a port or a Newark airport or the giant Fiat Chrysler factory in, uh, um, in Detroit. That from an AI math thing, that's just not a lot of data and it's not really hard to find the preventative, proactive, surprising patterns and questions that you should be asking uh -huh. around that. So the real trick is this. Can I build a stack that is really, really easy to populate with data at the edge, yeah. runs that AI Lego for me, and then here's the really hard part, has a user interface that I can train an average person, non-technical person to use in 10 minutes? That's the trick, and, and we've built that, right? Um, now, it's the early days. Uh, we use it in our own network. Uh, we've got it in alpha with uh, a few customers, but having easy, smart AI in real time at the edge is really going to start to uh, really start to change things. And I think it'll catch on, uh, catch on fast. Awesome. Yeah. You know, I'd like to turn to the second part of our talk here because, um, you know, I've known you for lots of years and, and uh, there are some people who, you know, say the kind of thing, some of the things that you do, but it's really more innovation theater, if you will, you know, people really can't get it done. And, and it's almost like you're know, you're assuaging the guilt of senior executives. It's like, oh yeah, we have an innovation group; they're doing all that stuff with the lab, or as opposed to truly transforming the organization. And I know that you have, and Viva and Motorola and MX really, you know, gotten things out of the lab and into practice. And um, you know, uh, we have our salmon here, right? Uh, the uh, going upstream. Uh, the, you know, so what are the kinds of things, Toby? Because the thing that 
the thing that I noticed about you is that you have what I would call an institutional sensibility. I think a lot of people talk about innovation are at the, hey, this is a cool new product, this is a cool new service, uh, you know, here's something new we can do, but they don't have it. They don't have respect for the for the singular fact that lar the purpose of large organization, not the purpose, but the operating environment and the operating ethos and the and the the values of a large organization to a large extent are to stamp out variance, to make it predictable, to take the distribution and squish it down, right? And and that's been true since the beginning of industrialization with Fred Taylor and you know scientific management and the whole routine. And that is so baked in the in those organizations that you know and 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 in a certain way senior executives are paid to stamp out variants, if you will. I mean, they never never speak of it like that. But here you are at the salmon. I mean, that that river of conformity is really what people are paid for, and you're swimming up the other way. And that's an institutional problem, right? It's not. It, it's kind of like it's. It's not a personality thing. Look, panda bears love bamboo. That's. That's not a statement about panda bears. That's just a fact. And large organizations hate variants. That's not you know. That's not a good or bad thing about the organization. It's just like the panda, you know. And so how do you how do you do that? Yeah. So I'd I'd add a couple of things to that. I, I think it's also just just being human, right? Very very few people wake up in the morning and go, oh man, I hope I get a bunch of change today, right? Uh, no, that's just, just not, right? I'm good at what I'm doing. I figured out how to show up at the ops review and win every month. And I, you know, I've got this thing oiled, right? Yeah. Um, I, I also think that, that there's a, a culture problem uh, with most companies. And I think it's two problems. I think people get confused what culture is, right? culture is this really complicated, difficult thing. It eats strategy for breakfast. I think that's just, what's the technical word? Bullshit, right? I, I think uh, um, culture, let, let's take the culture of France, right? Super complicated, includes dance theater, military history, uh, food cuisine. It's a difficult thing. If we wanted to change the culture of France, even if we had the power to do it, it would take generations. A culture of a company is not the same thing. Nowhere near as complicated. There's no dance theater at General Motors. They don't have a cuisine, right? They don't have a military history. Um, it The culture at a company is the sum of the behaviors. And the behaviors is just driven by what do you reward people for? What do you punish people for? And how well do you do that? If you don't do that really well and you're not really clear, your, your culture is sort of a bit of a mess, but it's definitely not the thing you wrote on your mission statement plaque and it's not in your uh, uh, in your credo, it's the, your sum of your behaviors. So if you think of that culture and all these people have been inside, there's a river of culture that they've got. And you have to be very, very aware of what that is because it's not a factual thing. It's a, it's a social thing. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to swim upstream against that culture, which you have to do occasionally for innovation, do it on purpose, not by accident and bring some people along with the culture uh, and do that. So the two things I think people miss in that is learn the vernacular of that culture, learn what the ar artifacts are, learn what the reward and punishment systems are, and then try and do something within those that drives uh, drives change, which is which is simply a lot of that is give away the credit, make sure it's a big win, uh, and and go earn the. Um, go earn the co the confidence. And one of the ways you start that out is you just bet your job, right? You say, look, I'll, you got to trust me on this one, find the person that will, but I will bet you my job this works. Now, if the big thing you show up to and do, do first fails, you're an idiot. You just, you've lost, you're done. You're, you're, uh, 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 you're out of there. B BPM, when we uh, brought that in and went big at Amex is an example, the same at same at Aviva. Business process. Um, yes. Yeah. And yeah. and then you you have to politely fight some of the cultural things, right? At Aviva, and I've seen this at many, many companies, people really got tortured for missing deadlines. And if you could show up and you were on the stoplight chart, you were green. All right, that's good. But we're focusing on the orange and the red, and we're going to beat the snot out of those guys because that's how we improve. No. What that really does is train people to pad deadlines and be really pl and play defense, right? Um, so 
so you, what, one of the first things I did there was found a really big project and, and gave it a, a impossible deadline and told the board, we're never going to hit that deadline ever. No human on earth could do it. But instead of being 18 months, they're going to get it done. We're going to tell them to do it in 125 days. They won't. They'll fail. They'll get it done in 140 or 150. And oh, by the way, look at that compared to the 18 months that you had listed before. Right. And then here's the key part. We're going to go give all those people a, a medal for missing that deadline by 25 days because it's literally three times faster than the way it would have gone under the other thing. And then you start to change what people get rewarded for and what they get punished for. And that changes the behaviors. The sum of your behaviors at a company uh, uh, is your culture. It's not what you wrote on some plaque, right? Yeah, but what I think is interesting, Toby, and I've seen you do this a number of times, is you really, you, first of all, you're willing to bet your job, which is a big ask of people doing innovation, right? When you come in and say, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna suggest something big enough that people are gonna notice if I don't make it. A lot of people come in and they say, oh, we're gonna do innovation, we'll create a portfolio, we'll have three horizons, right? We'll spend some money, we'll bring some people in, we'll set up an organization. That's not coming in and promise, figuring out what's big and important, promising something big and betting your job on it. That to me is how you have built uh, institutional, right? Because that then gives you license. And I know you mentioned the Aviva case, uh, you know, by name in the context of a project. I know in some other places you went in and we did things like, you know, put a sniffer on the network and found out, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars of unknown equipment. Now you wouldn't expect that from the innovation person, but you knew instinctively, well, from finding out and paying attention, that if you went in as the innovation guy and you went out and you found a couple hundred million dollars worth of waste in the technology infrastructure, that would give you the institutional credibility then to make some real changes. Yeah. Right. So, so at the first company I did that at, when that technology was just born, and I was very lucky to be on the advisory board of that startup when it was literally two guys and a whiteboard and me, yeah. um, I made a huge mistake, right? Uh, the guy that ran infrastructure said we had 9,000 Unix servers and we we found 12,000, right? So I was like, ha ha, look, we're right. Look at this, uh, 3,000. And this is when Unix servers were crazy expensive and actually big object, objects. So look, we've just saved this giant amount of money. We never have to buy one of these servers again for years. This is going to be great. Super embarrassing to the guy that ran uh, uh, infrastructure. So friction pull back at the next company i went to the head of infrastructure and said look this could be embarrassing but how about we do this together and when it's done you go upstairs to your boss and go ta-da 100 million dollars right um mm -hmm. and that just worked much much better the other thing that is key that is just purely political is in only big innovation jobs um uh that i've had you really need you need two parts. You need somebody upstairs at the top who's with you, right? And, and has got your back. The The CEO of Aviva literally wanted to change the whole company and was, uh, was up for that. Uh, the, the network of 5G labs that we built at Verizon, uh, not everybody was initially on board with that, partly because the word labs is just a bad, bad word. And there's a lot of bad uh, overhang with that. But the, the CEO said, you know what, Let, let's go they're not budgeted, but let's go do these. The second part of that is once you get that sort of pass and that permission to go do that, yeah. you have to go deliver, right? The the pivot point for us on on one of the pivot points for us on 5G Labs is the 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 CEO of one of the largest companies in the world uh, that begins with W that's in Arkansas spent an afternoon at the lab and went, holy cow, this was great. Thanks for that. I now get, I've got dirt under my fingernails on this 5G stuff. This is really important. Totally get it, right? So you, it's not enough to bet your job and get the right political thing. You actually really have to then go do something. And I'm back to the salmon going up the river. You have to have a, pr a proof point that makes sense in the culture that you're uh, that you're li living in, right? Something that, that returns investment. At, um, at Amex, the head of merchant stood up and said, hey, that new approach that we've got for building things, three times faster, three times cheaper. And it's the first time those IT monkeys built me something that I re that was really what I wanted, right? 
uh, and not I have to revise that in version two and three and four and five and six. So, so it's it's that whole um, proof in the pudding thing. Yes. Yeah, but at a scale. And you know, I, I want to turn to th something that you've brought up a number of times uh, from our friend Tony Paoni, actually. Um, this change management model. I think you know, uh, you know that I know that you have used this in your thinking. But we have this notion from the research about okay, what are the different ways you can do change? Edict, persuasion, participation, or intervention. Edict, persuasion, participation, intervention. So I'd like to do a, little, a poll here and ask folks, you know, what, which of these do you think is the uh, the most effective means of doing um, of, of doing organizational change? So if you can, if folks could just. So while they're doing that, a tiny vignette, I was super um, proud and sort of curious about being asked to join a, a three-day uh, uh, cloistered confab at Special Operations Command with Admiral McRaven and his direct reports. Uh, and I was like, you guys are the most innovative fighting force on earth. What on earth do you need this for? And he said something really wise that I kind of thought, well, I should have thought of that too. That's obvious. Uh, but really, I said, look, the enemy is continually getting more innovative. So if we're at the top of our game, um, we we should. This is the time to go uh, innovate. The the CEO of Walmart carries in his wallet a little spreadsheet of the top ten retailers uh, of the last five decades to remind him that people that were at the top of their game that had the impregnable fortress that were great are not only not on the top 10 list, some of them don't exist um, anymore. And then after that, they asked me to teach a class on a little lecture thing on um, how you create a culture of innovation across different cultures, right? Because if you think about Delta or Green Berets or Marine Force Recon or SEALs, they're crazy different cultures, right? Or Rangers. Um, uh, and I said, look, I'll only do that if you let me teach change management, because if you figure out where the destination is and you don't really know how these patterns work, uh, and they said, yeah, and it was just a, a wonderful honor uh, to do that. And then the sequester kicked in and all external training got killed, but it, it, at least it was uh, uh, as nice. And it's and it's kind of scary uh, teaching a classroom full of people who, who've been trained to kill you very easily, right? So Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of which model is the most effective, uh, in our audience, the, the most popular answer was persuasion. And, you know, from uh, Nutting's research, uh, he had the same thing. What? Yeah. yeah. Same. The, 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 most people think it's about persuasion, which is sponsoring attempts to sell or change, you know, persuade people to do it. And the, the, this is in terms of efficacy, right? Intervention. That is, sponsor justifies the need for change, monitors implementation process, communicates progress, really pushes things forward. So this notion of intervention, not persuasion, and also the mismatch, right? I know you said a lot about this. I mean, does this drive the kind of change that you've been doing? Yeah. So, so if you, I got to get a better way to explain this, but this is the only way I've got. If you put a gun to the head of the top 100 execs at most companies and say, what change management model do you use? You'd get like, uh, well, you know, we love change. We're all about change. No, no, what model do you use? You'd get mumbo jumbo from almost all of them. Uh, and then it, it, the ones that could answer it, if you said, okay, what are the four models? Because all of, it's sort of a tautology, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, all change falls into some variant of these, these four. Um, the real trick is making sure your team understands what model you're using. And, and you have that data and you say, look, we're using the intervention model because it works all the time. And one of the keys to intervention is you continually tell people, look, we're all in the boat. We're all rowing northwest. This is why we're going northwest. I want to remind you why that's a good idea and let's get going. And the other thing about the intervention model is there's a, there's a period of analysis, right? I mean, we're going we're gonna to just pull in data from everybody but then we're gonna say, this is the way we're going and we're going. And after that, there's no debate. You're in the boat rowing, right? And if you use a, an edict model, people will resent that. And though you'll have people in the back of the boat going, well, I'm not rowing, I didn't vote for that. 
the persuasion model, what happens is even worse. Um, people will come up with other clever opinions later and they may make micro sense and they'll go, oh yeah, let's go back and debate that and discuss that and do more analysis. Meanwhile, the intervention boat is rowing, right? And they're going. Um, uh, yeah, and so there's two, actually, there's a typo in here. It's- uh, It should be participation. Yeah, participation is the, um, uh, is that- uh, No, we're running short on- Fourth one. But yeah, but yeah, it's, and this is sort of new news to a lot of people who I've never thought about that. Just telling people the model you use that once we've decided, we're going. I, I don't care how you feel, we're all getting in the boat. And I'm gonna remind you, this is why we're doing this and why it's important, but let's go. Absolutely. Well, Toby, that's a great place to, to end in terms of things. Uh, and our, our thank, I wanna thank you for participating in this. Uh, it's great to have somebody who understands both the technology and the organizational implications. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick rest of the story here and then uh, talk about next time. So the rest of the story here is, I don't know if you and, uh, anyone knew about where Kingsford charcoal came from, but it actually was a cousin of Henry Ford. Henry Ford was worried about all the wood that he was wasting as he was building. It was the Model A, had the first wood in it. He said, can't we do something with this? And he got together with Kingsford and they figured out a way to turn that wasted wood into, uh, put it in a kiln and turn it into charcoal briquettes. So the creativity of uh, Henry Ford continues to amaze me. And I hope that that is useful to you at some cocktail party when we have cocktail parties again. All right. Um, in terms of next time, what's next? We're going to have Terry Jones. Terry was the C was the chief information officer at American Airlines, and then became the CEO of Travelocity, and then the founding chairman of Kayak. Talk about a guy who has absolutely disrupted an industry, and he has got some fantastic uh, stories from that, as well as a perspective on where he thinks uh, the economy is going, and travel in particular, and the economy in general as we get to the new normal in a post-pandemic world or post-COVID world when we get to vaccination, herd immunity, and so forth. So with that, Toby, thanks, man, for taking the time. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks to our audience. and hope this is useful to you and look forward to seeing you at uh, the, the, the last Friday of February. Bye-bye.